Ready? Okay, let's read. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Philippians. <laughs> Sorry. We can read it again. Ready? Let's go. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Wow. We should not be anxious for anything, huh? Okay, our next verse, Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Ready? Let's read. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Amen. And my burden is light. Amen. Two more, okay? John fourteen twenty seven. John fourteen twenty seven. Ready? John fourteen twenty seven. Ready? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. And one more. Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10. Ready? Okay. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. So do we need to fear, my dear brothers and sisters? No, we don't. But sometimes we forget. When we forget, we will go back to our Bibles. Can I have a one? Just one, okay? Any of you memorize John 14, 1 to 3? Margaret, can you recite it? And I'll give you a gift afterwards. I forgot the first word. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's. Okay, John 14, 1, 2, 3.
Amen. Okay, um, do we have birthday celebrants today? Birthday celebrants for the month of August. Only Avon? Oh, Diane. And uh, Arthur? Marvin, sorry, Marvin and Charlene. Okay, Leah will have a song for you and I have a small snack for you too. So uh, Leah will sing a birthday song for you. Okay. All right. I didn't know I was supposed to sing happy birthday or I just sing my special music. Okay. This is a song I just recently learned from my friend while I visited in California. And it's because of who you are. It's time for our mission spotlight. Thousand kilometers around, twenty-four thousand nine hundred one miles in circumference. The Earth is big, and you want to send a message. What do you do? A long, long time ago, the options were limited. You might have sent up smoke signals, blown a ram's horn, built a fire beacon, or sounded the drums. With the written word, hand-delivered mail became an option. 
Later, carrier pigeons became popular. In the 15th century, sailors started using maritime flag semaphores. In the 18th century, optical telegraph. Then the electric telegraph, signal lamps, and acoustic phonograph. Finally, in 1876, the telephone was invented. In a few years, wireless telegraphy and radio would follow. Television hit in 1927, and as early as 1946, there were limited capacity mobile phones in cars. Transatlantic telephone cable followed, then commercial satellites and fiber optics. By 1969, computers were networking with each other. Ship-to-shore satellite communications gave way to the first cellular phone network, and finally, the internet. Now, if you want to send a message to the other side of the planet, you can email, text, call, Skype, FaceTime, or voice over IP telephone if you want. 40,000 kilometers around, the world is very small. Ellen White had this to say, the vineyard includes the whole world and every part of it is to be worked. The whole earth is to be illuminated with the glory of God's truth. The light is to shine to all lands and all peoples. Our burden for the regions beyond can never be laid down until the whole earth shall be lightened with the glory of the Lord. Was the church up to that kind of challenge? Buckle up for a high-speed history lesson. The first half of the 20th century was filled with firsts for the Adventist church. The first church in Bangladesh, church in Indonesia, missionaries in Malaysia, tent meetings in Palestine, church in the Bahamas, church in Ecuador, evangelistic meeting in Jordan, indigenous church in Egypt, mission on the island of Guadalupe, converts in Puerto Rico, school in Hawaii, converts in Iran, training school in India, Adventists enter Sicily, church in Dominican Republic, academy in the Philippines, missionary school in Finland, Brazilian minister ordained, teachers institute in China, public meetings in Cambodia, church in Colombia, convert baptisms and church in Iraq, mission in Burundi, clinic in Malaysia, missionaries arrive in Liberia, mission among Guatemalan Indians, church on island of Martinique, church in Cameroon, evangelism in Guam and Micronesia, baptisms in Madeira Island, radio evangelism in Argentina and Cuba, missionary to Cape Verde, sanitarium in Korea, post-secondary school in Lebanon, house-to-house -house evangelism in French Guinea, radio evangelism in Brazil, summer camp in Puerto Rico, school in Ethiopia, church in Taipei, Taiwan, television broadcast of Faith for Today. At the turn of the 20th century, the church was operating foreign missions like smoke signals and carrier pigeons. But then, the countries that had received missionaries started sending out missionaries on their own. And then they sent out missionaries on their own. It's a small world after all. Between the end of 1910 and the end of 1950, over 650,000 new Adventists joined the World Church. And that's not all. We skimmed over one of the best parts of the story. Things got really exciting right around the start of the Great Depression. Wireless telegraphy, also known as radio. The history of this innovation feels like a soap opera. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla were rival inventors. Radios still rely on a Tesla coil component today. But just as Tesla was preparing to unveil a wireless transmitter that could carry a signal 50 miles, his workshop burned to the ground. Edison was known for using hired thugs and even the mafia. But the cause was most likely an electrical problem. With Tesla's work literally up in smoke, Guglielmo Marconi swoops in and manages to send the first transatlantic signal. His patent is later denied because the design relied on Tesla's work. Then the ruling was overturned in favor of Marconi when Andrew Carnegie and, you guessed it, Thomas Edison stepped in with marketing and money. In 1943, much later on, Marconi's patent was reversed again and posthumously awarded to Tesla. Getting radio to work at all was an endeavor filled with drama, but the effects on communication, culture, and society were even more dramatic. In 1905, the Japanese Navy obliterated a Russian fleet at the Battle of Tsushima, in part because they had purchased radio equipment from Marconi. Radio distress signals saved the lives of over 700 Titanic passengers, and subsequently, it became law for every vessel to have a wireless operator listening 24-7. People likened radio to newspapers, which was helpful in determining content, but there were several powerful distinctions. You don't need to be literate to listen to radio. 
You also don't need to make extra time because listening, as opposed to reading, can be a passive experience. You can listen to the radio while you work on other things. The radio was like cultural glue, uniting different classes and backgrounds under the banner of immediate information. The voice of the man on the street was heard alongside the voice of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds and alongside President Franklin D. Roosevelt's fireside chats. No president had ever spoken directly and simultaneously to the American people before. Politicians suddenly needed to become great orators. Propaganda was easily fed to the masses. There was another notable figure tied to the origins of radio. The same year Tesla's workshop went up in flames, Harold Marshall Sylvester Richards was born. When Marconi sent the first transatlantic signal, HMS Richards was seven. When his first live sermon was broadcast, Richards and radio were basically the same age. In 1929, HMS Richards Ministry took root in Los Angeles, California. After advertising one of the massive evangelistic crusades on the radio, the station offered him a daily spot for a family worship program. Richards was convinced. Evangelism must utilize the radio. But conference headquarters thought differently. Radio is so new it's never been done before, and besides, it's the devil's tool. After all, alcohol is advertised over the radio, and so are cigarettes. The devil's tool, that's what it is. While the conference remained unconvinced, Richards grew more obsessed. Finally, a friend confronted him. Harold, you still haven't done anything about radio. Do you believe in it? I know God wants me to do this. He won't leave me alone about it. Do you really believe God wants you on the radio? Yes, I do. I know he wants me on the radio. No, you don't. You don't believe in any such thing. What do you mean? I do believe it. I really do. Well, if God wants you on the radio and you believe that's where he wants you, why aren't you on the radio? The weight of his own fear and unbelief hit Richards like a ton of bricks. The very next night when he stood at the door to collect offering, he told the congregation that his left coat pocket would be the radio pocket. If they believed in the ministry's potential, they could donate. In the middle of the Great Depression, HMS Richard's local congregation gave $220. That equates to over $3,000 in 2015. They gave it in cash, gold jewelry, and even teeth. Night after night, the money for airtime filled the radio pocket. While most radio preachers only preached, Richards worked with a producer and musicians to create a professional, polished program called the Tabernacle of the Air. Once a week broadcast became daily broadcast. Letters poured in with questions, prayer requests, and cash. Programming expanded. Lone Star 4, an all-male quartet became a staple on the show. Evening meetings were recorded and sent out as far as the Atlantic coast, Alaska, New Zealand, and Australia. This went on for seven years with no support from the conference. Finally, in 1937, the Union Conference decided to unite with ongoing ministry and actually convinced HMS Richards to move into radio full time. From then on, the voice of prophecy was transmitted over the airwaves twice a week, coast to coast, by 89 different radio stations. After a renaming contest, the Lone Star 4 became the King's Heralds. Richards became a recognized radio authority. The Oregon Conference sent Julius L. Tucker to learn everything he could from Richards. Eventually, Tucker would learn enough to found his own program, The Quiet Hour. Today, because of HMS Richards, the voice of prophecy can be heard in nearly three dozen languages. Bible lessons are available in over 70 languages. Adventist World Radio broadcasts in 80 languages and estimates that they are able to reach an astounding two-thirds of the world's total population. Embracing new tools and innovation brought Seventh-day Adventist missions into the modern world, and radio was just a first step in another 50 years of growth.
Good morning. How is everyone? It's good to see you, Mary Joyce. It wasn't the same when you weren't there last week. I mean, it just wasn't the same. How was your week, everyone? Good. Did y'all notice the weather yesterday? <gasps> it was ordered from heaven, I promise you. The humidity was 57% in Ellisville. On my phone, that's what it said anyway. I chose to believe it. It felt like it. I hope you've all had really good weeks. I've had a good week. Kind of a busy, frustrating week in some ways. What do we need to pray about? We need to pray about Eloi. She sends her regards to everyone and she said, please don't forget me and please don't stop sending that quarterly. She says she continues to enjoy her Sabbath school lesson. Margaret. Who are about? Uh, at Children's Hospital. Ooh, very good, very good. Any other request? I s ask for your continued prayers for my husband. Uh, he's doing very well. His chronic pain in many ways is his biggest problem and his biggest um, implement, imp imp no, no, that impediment to his giving up his cigarettes, I think, but he struggles, so pray for him. He loves the Lord, he just, and it dawned on me this week, I know, mm, I reckon 60 years ago, Mary Faith, when did little mama quit smoking, reckon? Can you remember that she smoked? So it's probably been closer to 60, 65 years ago. My grandmother, who lived in Louisville, Kentucky, was struggling struggling giving up cigarettes and her daughter came to her and said mama you pray about everything else why don't you pray about smoking and do you know she did and she quit and that was it and I can barely barely remember my grandmother smoking I couldn't have been very old but it's hard it's very hard to give up that hand to mouth some of us eat and some of us smoke and some of us drink. Some of us do other things that, the things that come out our mouths are what get us in trouble. But, you know, Christ had a way of helping the helpless. You know, and in prayer circle this morning, we talked about the people in Syria, the people in Turkey. Turkey. We cannot begin to comprehend the desperation of parents that would put them on a small raft to cross the Mediterranean Sea with children. We cannot comprehend it. And yet one day, what will we face? Did you I wish y'all would let them know how much they're missed. I really, really do. She promised me they were coming back. I haven't spoken to her in several weeks, but, and that I should have done better in that respect. But she always thanks me when I call. So, you know, touch them, touch them. We all need touch them. Ah, there you go. That's, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. And I've got their phone numbers. I don't know if they'd appreciate me giving them out, but I text them occasionally, particularly on Friday. You know, I like to text them. But we need to remember the people that are not here. Penny, that, mm. And see, she's even quit meeting me to exercise. So, and she told me she really was coming back. She really appreciated me being patient, you know, to pray for her. She's having a hard time with her job. But Penny Beach is Mary Joyce's niece, right? Yeah, yeah that's right, niece. Rennie's first cousin, right? Is that okay? 
so that um, pray for her. She needs the prayer. She's a diabetic and she's having health problems and the stress that she's going through at work is not helping a bit. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for having an opportunity to come apart and associate with like believers and help us to love each other, help us to feel that love, help us to hear that love. And Father, those that are not here with us, John and Clara, if nothing else, we just miss their presence on that pew, but we all enjoy her music. Father, I think of Elois and Cassandra, that whole entire Millsap family. Father, be with them and give them a desire a desire to come and meet with us on Sabbath. Be with Penny, Father. Warm her with your love. Help us find new ways to meet her needs. Help us love her, Father, just like you love us. Father, I think of Margaret's granddaughter. I ask that you Help her that you give her strength, wisdom, and understanding. Help her to be able to be the person that you have created her to be and to be able to locate this job that she needs. Father McKenzie, we've all heard about McKenzie. And I ask that you be with her parents, that you be with her doctors. But Father, be with the researchers and help them have an aha moment. Father, we know that you work miracles and we ask that you touch each part of this chain. And in each one of our lives today, Father, come into my heart and change me. Re-knit me, remake me, recreate me in your image. Father, help us as we study. Guide us as we think. Give us Give us presence of mind to know and understand what it is that you want us to do right here in Jones County, right here where we live, or right here next door where our family, church family lives. Help us, Lord. Guide us, teach us, show us. Forgive us when we fail you. Help us to overcome our weaknesses and depend on you instead of our strengths. These things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Rennie, do you have a teacher's quarterly with you today? I do. Give me that couple's name in that story, you know, back over in the helps, that very first story. Doctor and Dr. Miller, wasn't it? It's the very, right under the purpose, you know, that gives you the reason for the lesson. Have you got a teacher's quarter? Oh, good for you. Let me borrow this a minute. Thank you. I'm not going to tell y'all where mine is. In 1902, 1902, that was a long time ago. Any of you remember 1902? Hmm. Yes, Harry and Maud Miller graduated from, and I wrote the name of the College of Medical Evangelists. There's a monument there today, or there was last time I looked. That's where they went. They went to China. They both were graduating near the top of their class. They had the requests and offers from, you know, bright, bright futures. And yet, they chose to go to China as missionaries. And after 50 years of service, he could look back and it says that he had ministered behind, beside the cot of the poor, that General Chiang Kai-shek, uh, early, because it doesn't talk about her service so early, but General Chiang Kai-shek of the Republic of China was a patient of his. And reckon how that man was encouraged to be what he was just because 
Harry Miller chose to go to China in 1902. I don't know about thyroid. I know he worked on a formula for soy milk for children because of allergies and all that, but I don't know about thyroid. He was a gifted surgeon. Those words are used, right, Nancy? A gifted, brilliant maybe surgeon, something. There was another high-ranking Chinese officer that needed the thyroid surgery that came to him. So that, you know, God's school has sent out many, 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 many people. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Every disease and sickness. And this morning while I was reading uh, and I don't remember what book it was out of. It was one of the little devotionals, I think. It talked about why he never bore disease in his body. He carried the sickness and the affliction of the people with him. He carried them with him. As we look at the lesson this week, I want to go back. Uh-oh, it's not here. Ah. Christ's methods alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. What does that mean? One who desired their good. Does that have any special meaning or reference or application, Margaret? Well, he desired what was best for them here on earth, and he desired for them to be in heaven. Be there in heaven for eternity. He desired their good. He desired their good. So as we mingle, actually, we're supposed to be desiring the people's good that we mingle with. Eric. Ooh, that's a good way to look at it. This is true. This, and even in our jobs, when we're doing good things, we're earning a paycheck, aren't we? Even when we do really good things. We need to remember that many of Christ's miracles, we talked about, I mentioned this last week, I didn't realize how much thunder I was stealing from this week, but a need should never be an interruption, even when it is. A need should never be an interruption, even when it is. In Mark 5, 22 through 43, what do we hear about? What, what, what's going on here? And what's the backstory? When Jesus gets off the boat, what's there? Lots of people, isn't it? He's just come across the uh, Sea of Galilee. I can't remember what they called it. Um, yes, and where they had the meeting with the guy or the guys out of Gadarea, the Gadarenes. They had just had that meeting. Now they come back to shore on the other side, and there's this huge crowd. And of course, there's, can you imagine what it's like in that crowd, the jostling and the me first, and you know. Reckon? Reckon it's that way? But who comes to him and kneels down? No, no, 
Darius, what do we know about him? What was his job or his avocation? Let's put it that way. I don't know. Okay. He was the ruler, the ruler of the synagogue, the head of the synagogue. And he knelt at Jesus' feet. Do you think that was easy for him to do? It was probably very easy, wasn't it? He was probably at his wit's end. He knew, just like those people that get on those rafts in the Mediterranean Sea, he had nowhere else to turn. And that's why they get on those rafts, those boats, those whatever it is they're on. They have no alternative. And so he comes and he says, please, please come. My daughter is at death's door, and I'm going to lose my only child, my only child. So, of course, Jesus goes with him, and he's interrupted, isn't he? But she's not even bold enough to speak, is she? She's not even bold enough to get in front to elbow her way to front center place. She is convinced in her heart if she can but touch the hem of his garment. And I don't know if any of y'all listened to Doug Blatchler's lesson this week. I listened to it twice, and he pointed out a lot of things that were really, really interesting about this 12-year-old little girl and about this woman who had been very ill for 12 years and how one represented the Old Testament and the sacrificial system, and one, read it, one represented the New Testament and the church of the new church that was actually forming at that time. So then what happens? She's healed. He says, who touched me? You got to be kidding. You got to just be kidding, Jesus. Who touched you? But it wasn't the touches that counted. It was the faith behind the touch, wasn't it? The faith behind the prayer. The faith behind the act. And so Jarius got, got um, word that his little girl was dead. And basically, let me paraphrase. Oh, can I find it? Oh, that verse... Joy that you read. Yeah, here it is. Philippians 4. Philippians 4, 6. Don't worry about anything. And the verse goes on to say, instead, pray about everything. But what did he tell him? What did Jesus tell Jairus at this point? What did he say, Brenda? Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. He gave him two instructions. Do not be afraid. And believe. Don't you know that? <sighs> Welled up in his heart, don't you know that hope took root? And sure enough, when they got there, the mourners and all the commotion that they can bring, but he sent everybody away, go home. And he told the people that had been following, go home. Just us, just, just us four are going to go with this father. And so he touches her and he says, get up. Get up. And she does. It wasn't an interruption, was it? It was that young girl's life. Needs are not interruptions. Needs are not interruptions. Is that clock right, Mary? That one? Okay. Okay. Okay, let's see. Mark 10, 46, 52. And John 5, 1 through 9. We've got two different cases going on here. Rennie, would you look at Mark 10, 46, 52? Aubin, 
Do you mind looking up John 5, 1 through 9, and let's get a synopsis? What did Jesus do in these two situations? Rennie, have you got it? <laughs> she looked at you attentively. <laughs> uh, you misinterpreted the look. Thy faith has made it home. What can I do for you? Faith. Okay, uh, Aubin, John 5. What are we going to find out here? My translation, a New Living Translation says, would you like to get well? That's why he was laying there, wasn't it? And yet, very little hope in his position laying there. Very little hope. Very little hope. Would you like to get well? Remember that you can break down the severest opposition by taking a personal interest in people whom you meet. Christ took a personal interest in men and women while he lived on earth. This is at the bottom of the page of Monday's lesson. Wherever he went, he was a medical missionary. We are to go about doing good even as he did. We are instructed to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, comfort the sorrowing. Comfort the sorrowing. Down at the bottom of the page, I want to read that in the green box. It said, most of us have no problem expressing our opinion. How can we learn to be better listeners? How can we learn to be? And that's what I need to do. That, 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 
right, for some of us, the mouth seems, before our minds get engaged in gear, the mouth seems to talk. And sometimes you don't even have to know what they're interested in. You say, what can I do for you? What, what can I do for you? Crying. Roger. To listen. And when she got through, what'd she say? I feel so He wanted to fix it. Oh, it's, I want to fix it. Man, let me fix it. Just a minute. What, Judy? Right. It's their responsibility. No, <laughs> Mary and I had this kind of situation. Yeah, right, right, right. Mary and I had a situation in Grenada. Oh, I came home every day. My husband knew her first name and knew all about her. You know, it was a problem. Just pretty soon you fill up and boom, you're gone. That's right. That's exactly right. Let's look at Mark 2. What do we find in Mark 2, 1 through? I'm sorry, Pernell. Excuse me. I think this is why Christ asked these questions. Oh? You'll do something. what the real situation is. What is the real need behind the words? Thank you. 
We had to participate with the Holy Spirit, don't we? And sometimes you don't have to ask the question. You can observe that person and notice what they're going through. And um, like in Matthew 14, 14, when he died, noticed, you know, a need, you know, among the people, a great number of people. And said he had compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. There was a need to be healed. That compassion. Marvin? And he can use this, can he? Um, Daddy used to work at Sears and Roebuck. He worked in the Sears Sporting Goods Department. That's where he retired from, was Sporting Goods. Um, one day he called Mama. He says, Mama, I'm bringing somebody home with me to spend the night. A young couple had come in, and she was obviously great with child. She was going to deliver at didn't there used to be a charity hospital here? Yeah. At the charity hospital here in town, I've been by there one time. I can't quite remember. It's kind of behind where the, anyway, it doesn't matter. He, the young man wanted to buy a tent. It was just about time for the baby to be born, and they had to be at the hospital at a certain time and they lived too far away. And so the young man wanted to buy a tent. And Daddy, you know, started to sell him a tent, but it was raining. And Daddy said, well, well what are y'all going to do? He says, oh, we're going to camp until, you know, my wife has to go to the hospital. Can you imagine trying to sleep on the ground. I don't know what they brought with them to sleep. Can you imagine being nine months pregnant and camping? We sometimes don't need to ask questions, and sometimes we do. Christ asked questions, and sometimes he found out deeper, deeper, deeper needs. And as we talk about, um, oh, I've lost my place because I stopped to look up what Purnell was talking about. And we, Jesus came back to Capernaum and news got around that he was in Capernaum. This was fairly early in his ministry, but yet people, people thronged him because of the few miracles that he had already worked. Um, maybe some of the people in that room had actually tasted the wine that he made. I don't know. But this house is crowded. You couldn't even, there wasn't a place at the door or the window to stick your head in. But there was a man that lived in the town. He existed in the town, but he had some really good friends. And he knew, and they knew that if I could get him to Jesus, he would heal him. But this young man knew that his actions had caused his situation. His own choices had put him in a paralyzed state on his mat. But these four young men 
took him, and when they got to the house and they couldn't get in, they didn't go, oh, we tried, but that's all we can do. I can't imagine getting, you know, that stretcher, four different people pulling. You know, how do you pull the outside up even with the inside without dumping them out? or one end going this way because his body weight wasn't properly distributed and you're pulling. But they pulled him up on top of the house. They put him on top of the house. They took the tile off the ceiling and they lowered him. Talk about interruptions. Interruptions. But what was the first thing that Jesus said to this young man or this older man, whoever? Thy sins be forgiven. The very words he longed to hear. Thy sins be forgiven. So sometimes we don't know the real situation. But by being in tune with the Holy Spirit, by opening ourselves up to be a channel for the Lord to use, We can be told what to do and where to go and how to go about it. What do we know about Darkus and Joppa? She sewed a lot, reckon she weaved beyond her cloth. I'm glad you're here. Reckon? Reckon she had to weave it before she made the coats? If she was poor, I assume she did. But someone came to Capernaum, wasn't it? Capernaum and said, come, 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 please come. We've lost her. She's our help. She's our mainstay. She has helped so many people. Everybody knows her because she goes about doing good. And so there was prayer. And because of her goodness, maybe, because of her being Christ's hands in Joppa and the need of the widows that she helped take care of, she was raised from the dead, wasn't she? Did you look there on the bottom of Wednesday's lessons, the three type of churches, three styles of churches? The settlers, the gardeners, and the shepherd. Which are we? What do we choose to do? What is it that we want to do? Is there anything that we can do in Jones County to affect it? At the first of this quarter, I decided to do a very brief survey. I text two people that I knew real well. One had been an officer of the court here in Laurel, and so he knew the situation. So I text him, and I said, if the church were going to do something in Laurel, what do you think? we could do? What, what do you see as the most pressing need of the city of Laurel? And he said, the homeless situation and drugs. Those were the two things that he said because of his very close association. Was he, um, he wasn't a probation officer, was he? He was just I'm not sure exactly what his job was, but it was connected with the courts through the police department here in Laurel. And the other person I text, um, I, it was interesting to me. His text came back and he said, well, Trish, I'd have to say drugs and the homeless situation. They were both one was a former police officer. One is a police officer today, not here in Laurel, in Ellisville. But those are the needs. What can we do? What is there for our church to do? 
Are we going to settle? Are we going to garden? Are we going to shepherd? Thursday's lesson, commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. When you're looking for something to do and trying to decide what to do, ideally there, that second paragraph says, well, let's look at the first paragraph. What does it say? Once your church has a clear vision of how it can minister to the community, so we have to develop a plan. Do we have a clear vision that there's a need in Laurel? It's interesting, isn't it? It was very interesting to me. So what do we go to? We go to the Bible in the spirit of prophecy and we try to find out what it is we can do. That's a wonderful ministry. It is a ministry, a self-supporting ministry, I might add. So is this our aha moment? Do we say, aha, we need to get together, evaluate our skills, and see what we can do to introduce the people of law in Mississippi to the Jesus Christ that we know? Is that... very large group and most of them I would dare say are ignorant of the fact that they're disobeying his law oh I know they're not I know they're not and I'm speaking of people in general the general public not the ministers not the ministers but yet we do know the Holy Spirit is working and as we identify families that the Holy Spirit is working with, Margaret. Good.
they'll stumble over it again, maybe. Right. You got to start somewhere. Or you won't never get started doing all what you desire at all. In order to be able to complete your thoughts and desires of completing and continuing the work that you had in mind. So. Right. Three questions. I want to leave you with three questions. What does God want from me? What does Laurel, Mississippi need? And what can we do well? What is there that we can do well? I want us to all remember that coming to church, sitting in our assigned pew, they're not assigned, I know that, but our assigned pew doesn't make us a Christian any more than going down to um, a mechanic shop and going inside. And I'm going to use a, a different term than he used, and I'm going to use Roger Fernandez's term. It won't make me into a mechanic when I go in that shop, will it? But Roger Fernandez said he won't even make me a Mercedes if I go in that shop. So coming in this door every Sabbath morning is not all that Jesus Christ wants from us. What can I do? What can I do well? How can we serve the needs of this community? Jesus' followers will move beyond emotional feelings of sympathy to show sympathy. And we've got a Greek word here that's way beyond me, but it means to show sympathy. This use of the word refers to an act in contrast to mere emotion. It leads to benevolent activity as is often associated with helping others through giving alms, are like Tabitha, like Dorcas, as we know her more by, like Dorcas. It actually led to activity, activity beyond ourselves, beyond who we are, what we think. Christ's methods alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them. He ministered to their needs. He won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. If this church disappeared off of this plot this afternoon, would anyone miss this church? Let's stand and be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for these lessons. Thank you for this couple that have spent their lifetime studying and understanding not only the psychology, but Christ's methods. Help all that we do bring honor and glory to you. But help us do something. Help us act. Help us go beyond feeling into actual touch. Father, be with us. Be with Ricky as he leads us in our study. Help us to comprehend fully what the belt of truth is and what it's for. These things we ask in thy holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your participation. I appreciate it. Ah, thank you. I'll put it back. Appreciate it.
Good morning, church family. Turn in your hymnals to 287. Let's sing a few songs and we'll get the outside crowd inside. 287 to start with.
the last. One page over to 289. This is one of Dr. Roddy's favorite songs. 289. Granddaddy's favorite songs. Charlie's too. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you? First verse only. Out of my 